to the cloud. Okay, hey everybody, this is Carolyn with the Women's Closet TV Show. And tonight's topic is going to be on homeschooling pros and cons versus traditional schooling. So I'm not gonna focus on traditional schooling because everybody already know about traditional schooling. Jackie, I would love to have you come in to my live stream, but I don't know how to do it. But I do have the button pushed for you to request to come into the live stream. Hey, Camille, I'm gonna call you later, but thanks for tuning in and just stay with me because um, I'm talking about homeschooling versus traditional schooling, the IEP process, and I have a um, I have Jackie on here, which is an advocate for special needs children. I just don't know how to bring her into my Facebook Live because there's things, like even as an educator, it's not like I know everything because I taught with the Philadelphia School District, but there's some things I probably don't know that Jackie do know. So I'm trying to figure out how to do I get her into the live stream, that's one. Other thing I wanna talk about, I got my notes here, is dyslexia and preschool preschool children. I definitely wanna talk about that because a lot of times our children are labeled as, they just label our kids. School psychologists just label our kids. And if you are not a parent that's like involved in the process, your child can be labeled or misdiagnosed because that has happened with some children that I am aware of that they were misdiagnosed. And I'm gonna get into all that later. So anyway, let me get started. Homeschooling versus traditional schools. I wanna focus on homeschooling because a lot of parents and a lot of grandparents, and I have to say grandparents because in today's time, you do have um, grandparents that are raising their grandchildren for one reason or another, um, to help out mom, um, to help out dad, or to help whatever. But in today's time, you'll see grandmom is there, grandpa is there, it's the grandparents that are involved and engaged in this little baby's, this little angel's lifestyle. If y'all have not already shared, please share. I know it's a warm sunny day outside and people wanna enjoy the weather, but I still have to show up whether the weather is nice or not. So I'm not on a computer right now, maybe this is why. Oh, no, if you're on your phone, Jackie, I still should be able to bring you in. I just don't know how to do it. Thanks, Camille, for the heart love. So when it comes to homeschooling, because a lot of parents and grandparents, as I said, is looking at different options compared to traditional school. So let's talk about some of those options of why parents and grandparents is looking at homeschooling compared to traditional schools. And one of the main reasons is the violence that are that is in the schools that's number one number two reason is that most parents feel as though their child or children is not getting the quality education that they should be getting two main reasons why parents grandparents are looking at homeschooling their child so now we got the two main reasons out the way, the violence that is in the schools and the quality of the education that our children, the angels are getting. They feel as though they're not getting it. So homeschool, what happens with homeschool? One, <clears throat> what I learned is that you would think that, yes, and bullying as well. Yes, Jackie, and bullying is also on the list too. So. One of the things I learned here in Philadelphia when we was checking out um, homeschooling programs for my grandson 
is that when I went down to the district, they said, oh, we don't have a homeschool program for children at the age of four. You'll have to wait until he turns five. But at five, he's at kindergarten stage. Hmm. We trying to get him set up now before he had turned five. So what we did was we went online and we called a lot of places and we search and parents, you got to do your homework with this. And we search for quality keyword quality, because there are a lot of homeschool programs out there. So we search for quality home school programs where the, the individuals that was in charge of that homeschool can answer all our questions, answer all our concerns, and not try to just rush us off because we're asking too many questions. So the plus part, hi, Kevin, the plus part about the pro part about homeschooling is that one, you can tailor your child's education as long as it fits into the curriculum that's designed for that grade age. I hope y'all follow me with this. You can design, create your child's curriculum as long as it fits into the guidelines according to the grade and age of your child in that homeschool program. Because there's two types of homeschool programs. One, you could do it yourself. The other one is you connect with a online homeschool where they will send your child a laptop or computer, the books, whatever, and your child actually get assigned into a classroom online with a certified teacher. So those are two ways. The first way I described it, you do it yourself. You, you take the time out and you have to like literally be in class with your child during school hours, except for you're the teacher. You are the homeschool teacher. You are the parent you're doing the teaching. And if you do it that way, there's tests that your child must take. There's designated places schools where your child can go to and take the test to be promoted to the next grade up. That's the original way it used to be done until online homeschool programs came out. So now you have the online homeschool programs where your child get assigned a teacher and they are actually in class, but it's, it's like a live interactive class online you can see the teacher, the teacher can see your child. That's two ways. What are, I'm shining y'all because I'm having a hot flash. Hold on. I get these all day. Anytime y'all see me go live, whether I'm live on t live Facebook TV or I'm live on the radio and you see me do this, that's because my behind is having a freaking hot flash. So where was I? Because I'm so I'm so I'm so amped up about this. Oh, if you decide to do it that way, that's good. That's real, that's really, really good because your child will be in a classroom with a teacher. But keep this in mind, there's other children in that classroom online other than your child. If you decide to take that route. I'm going to tell you, and I suggest that you do this, be in the classroom, even though it's an online classroom, be in the classroom with your child. Don't just leave your child sitting at the computer and say, okay, you in school and you go off and you do something else. Don't do that. Be in the classroom with the teacher online with your child so you know the lessons and you know what's going on and you can keep up in that classroom for for my grandson me and pop pop is the designated individuals 
that would be in class with my grandson because my daughter has a business to run and my schedule is more flexible. Me and Papa's schedule is more flexible compared to my daughter. She got a business to run. We'll, we'll handle that. Once she get home, he got more homework to do because now we know what's scheduled. But when mommy come home, he got another two hours to do. And he's only five. Now, y'all know me. I'm an educator. I'm all about education. If it was left up to me, kids would be in school during the winter. They would be in school in the summer. I'm, I'm very big on education. Now, once you do that, another, and when I say pros and cons, here are the kind side of it that people keep blasting their mouth off about. What about social environment for the child? Hi, Chantel. What about social environment for the child? If you take your child out of a school or you don't put your child into a school, they're not going to know how to socially interact with other kids. You know what I say to that? Bullshit. Because even though a child is in an online homeschool or you are homeschooling that child yourself, there's programs where that child can still be socially interactive. The school that we selected for my grandson, they go, hi, Shiny, they go on class trips. So when someone says to you, if you put your child in, if you homeschool your child, the child is going to lose out on social interaction. No, they not. It's all about what you create for that child so that that child or your children can still be socially interactive with other kids. Every kid, I think, has a cousin, a brother, a sister. Some of them got uncles and aunts they same age or close to it. Then you have organizations like Jamboree. Jamboree, in case y'all don't know, Jamboree is a place where you could take your child and they have different things that go on in Jamboree. There's, there's Jamboree and there's other ones that are like Jamboree, but they just call it something different. And when you go there, they have teachers that are there and they have um, designated stations. They're interactive play, but they're learning. So social environment, because there's other kids there that are your child's age because it's done by age group, not grade group. For social interaction, when you take your child to, to like places like Jamboree, it's done by age group, not grade group makes a difference because when you go there there's other children there your child's age there's a teacher there that is playing interactive games social games but they're all learning games so they're not running around like some kids that's high on sugar okay y'all have any questions jackie is it anything i'm missing that you want to add to it just type it in so everybody else can see it Jackie, everybody, is an author, and she is also an advocate for children with special needs. So, Jackie, if I miss anything, I really wanted to bring you into this live stream, but I just don't know how to do it. And as far as I know, you got to ask to be in the live, and then I just hit approve, and you in. But I don't know how to do it the other way. So the other part I want to talk about is the IEP, Individual Evaluation Plan for a Child that has been diagnosed as a special needs child. And what I want to say about this, parents, grandparents, is when it's time, once your child has been designated 
with having some type of learning disability. Your child, I guess, depending on what state, what city, what school, your child is going to be put in a special needs class, sometimes an inclusion class. And what I mean by that is this, when so far you're hitting, okay, all right, thanks, Jackie. When I was teaching sixth grade, I taught sixth grade for three years. Yeah, sixth grade I taught for three years. And we had, I had children that were special needs children, whether it was Tourette's, dyslexia, which we're going to talk about, or some other type, autism, or some other type of special needs. So these special needs children, at a certain point in the school day, would be sent to my class. That's called inclusion. So they can get whatever subject that's not taught in their class, they got it in my class. If that if that makes any sense. Hopefully it does. Okay. So once your child is, I hate to use these words. The, the school psychologist it's, it's just words I hate to use, but that's what they that's that's what they do. And it's 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 irritating to a point. Um once your child is diagnosed with a learning disability, your child and you is going to be set up called an IEP session. I'm going to tell you who's supposed to be in this IEP session. You better be there. That's number one. The teacher and sometimes the school psychologist. As a parent, make sure that you are there in that IEP session. Once your child has been diagnosed, I'm, let me backtrack for a minute. Do I'm gonna say this? Do not ever, ever let anybody. Give your child a specialized test and you are not there. I'm gonna say this again, cause this is so important and I have seen it so many freaking times. Do not, and you can make this known to the principal, make it known to the school psychologist. So the school psychologist is aware, listen, I can't test this child without this parent being here. I've seen school psychologists test the child and the parent was not there. Then after that, after the, after the school psychologist did this, and when I say test, there's different kind of tests. Depending on what the school psych what the school psychologist suspect, I'm gonna give you an example. Real talk, true story. There was this child who was I can't tell y'all the school, so I'm gonna leave that out. There was this child who was in this school I'm gonna say second grade the school psychologist had this child she was asking the child questions when the school psychologist asked the child questions she also asked the child to draw 
based on what that child drew, the school psychologist came up with a conclusion. When the school psychologist came up with the conclusion, that's when the school psychologist notified the parents. They had a meeting. Parents showed up. School psychologist stated to the parents what she felt was going on in the household based on the pictures that the child drew. How the hell you come up with that shit? That's what they do. Hopefully, they change the way things are done. Don't know, I'm not a school psychologist. It may still go on today. When the school psychologist said what she said to the parents and she asked the question, is there a problem at home? To me, it was an inappropriate question from the school psychologist to be asking those parents. So it gets further and further and deeper and deeper, but I'm going to leave it right there. I wanted to share that information with you based on what I observed, what I saw, and what I heard. This is how come I say, if your child is suspected of having a disability, you make damn sure your butt is in there with that school psychologist. Period. I don't care. Make sure that you make it known your child is not to be tested without your presence. Hope y'all getting this, parents. Okay? So that's what I wanted, I wanted to share that. Now I'm fast forward to the IEP. When it comes to the IEP, the teacher is going to, and it's a team effort. It's an effort on the teacher's part. It's also an effort on your part as a parent. The teacher has to do the IEP. You, the parent, has to participate because it's a team effort. The teacher is going to, and you're going to get, a, you should get a copy of this. I have said in enough IEP meetings, I know what I'm talking about because I had inclusion special needs children in my class. So even though I was the inclusion teacher, I still had to do an IEP for my special needs angels. When you are in there, the teacher is going to write out the IEP. You as the parent should be reading that IEP. If there's something on there that you don't agree with in that IEP, you let the teacher know what you don't agree with and what you do agree with. Make sure that you are in there whenever there is an IEP meeting. When you get that letter in the mail, or you get that letter sent on by your child, letting you know when the IEP meeting is, make it, that, make it a priority. I don't care what you got to do. You make that a priority and have your butt in that school for that IEP. That IEP weighs heavy on your angel as far as the progress of your child and their learning ability based on their disability. Okay? Number, I thought one, two, that was number two. So I'm moving on to number three. And I picked this, dip, I can't say this word, y'all. I picked the disability dyslexia because in the United States, 
in the, I'm going to say public schools, because most of our kids is in public schools, um, there is a 5 to 10% population that is diagnosed, I hate that word, diagnosed with some type of disability. And I'm going to give you all some numbers. Out of 20, I'm going to give you some numbers. Out of 20 students, three of them is going to be diagnosed with dyslexia across the board. Those are stats. Those are numbers. Didn't make it up. Look it up. yourself. So I want to talk about dyslexia because there's different types. Let me check this off first. I haven't talked about that. Talked about that. And now I'm on here. So there's three types of dyslexia. And dyslexia simply means the inability of a child to process language. And lately, dyslexia has been diagnosed in preschool children. I'm going to also give you the warning signs of dyslexia, okay? There's three types of dyslexia. Now, I know some adults that are dyslexic. And out of the adults I know that are dyslexic, they were told that they will always be dyslexic. And these individuals, two of them, um, are now millionaires. They're dyslexic. But they're millionaires, and I know them. They were average people that's been diagnosed with dyslexia, and they'll tell you, they will tell you their story. But their coping mechanisms for dyslexic people, they have learned to cope, they have learned to live, they have learned to take care of themselves and they had the sense enough to know how to make a million dollars. How dyslexic is that? Don't know. They did it, but they're dyslexic. So there's three types. You have auditory dyslexic, you have visual dyslexic, and you have self-expression dyslexic. So for Preschoolers, because I'm sticking with preschoolers here, for preschoolers who are dyslexic and they have an auditory, that's because they hear things differently compared to a person, a child who don't have dyslexic. It's going to be different. Visual, they see different. The numbers run different, totally, compared to a child who's not dyslexic. Writing expression, they're going to have a hard time with it. Dis keep this in mind. Dyslexic is the inability or the disability of expressing yourself visual and processing the language. It's all about processing up here in the brain because dyslexic, dyslexic, oh, dyslexic children, dyslexic adults, they process it differently up here in the brain. No fault of their own. It's not their fault. It's just they have that disability, okay? Um, I don't want to give you the warning signs yet. I'm going to tell you, no, I'm going to give you the warning signs. The warning signs for preschoolers that you can tell that I'm going to say maybe, and I'm going to use that word. I like that word maybe compared to the other word. Delayed language development. And I'm going to tell you who can determine this. After I give you the warning signs, I'm going to tell you who can determine this. And once I tell you this, you're like, yeah, that did happen when I took my child there. Okay? So it's delayed language development has trouble calling things by their right name. And like, if, for instance, if you want them to say animal, they may say minimal. 
but that's their way of saying it because they can't say it. That is the third type of dyslexic that I gave you, expression. Um, they struggle in school with learning letters, colors, and names, I think. Yeah, letters, colors, and names. They will have a hard time with that learning. If you have a child or you know someone who has a preschooler that is showing these warning signs, ask that parent, when was the last time the child been to the pediatrician? If they are school age, when was the last time the child was tested with the special test? And I'm gonna tell you what the special tests are. If y'all have any questions for me, just type them in. If you got any questions, type them in. Jackie is on here. If Jackie, if I miss anything, just um, let me know. Just type it in, Jackie, because I'm trying to stay on point. But I just got, I, I have bullet points. And I'm, with the bullet points, the rest is up here and in here. So those are the warning signs. It can be diagnosed, as I said, through the pediatrician or the school psychologist. Now, I'm going to ask y'all this. <clears throat> if y'all have children, do y'all recall when your child was first born and you take your child to the pediatrician every so many months or every so many weeks? And when you get to the pediatrician, your child, the pediatrician, test your child for different things in development according to their age. Do anybody remember this? Oh, I am just an OG that remembers this. Because mine's is 41, 31. And I know they did it with mine. So when you took your child to the pediatrician, the pediatrician would test your child to see if your if your baby can do certain things at their age. Okay, that's one way, and you would get a report. Today they give reports. They give you a computer printout today, and on that computer printout it'll tell you what your child is doing if they're in the normal range and doing what they're supposed to be doing at the age they are at as babies preschoolers that's one diagnosis from the pediatrician the other way a child is diagnosed is through school psychologists excuse me and i'm going to give you the three tests that the school psychologist uses I'm going to say this. I can't stress this. I can't, I, I can't stress this hard enough. Be there when your child is tested. There's no such thing. Don't let no school psychologist tell you, oh, you can't be here when your child is tested. Don't let nobody tell you that. Grandparents, don't let nobody tell you that you cannot be there when your child is being tested. You have a right as a parent, legal guardian, grandparent, to be there when your child is being tested. Let's talk about tests. There are two tests. One is called the Wessler's Intelligence Scale. I'm going to tell you all about these tests in a minute. The other one is called the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale. Those are the two tests. These tests measure your child's intelligence, your child's IQ, and the achievements that they have made in preschool or school. If it's done by a school psychologist, it's going to be measured 
based on your child's IQ and your child's achievements in school. That's the measurement. It is what it is. Y'all have any questions? Ask me. Um, type them in. Before I move on to one, two, three, before I move on to four, if you got any questions, type them in before I move on to four. Because now I want to talk, did I cover everything? No, I didn't. The other thing is, it's been research documented that if there's a child that has dyslexia, there is a family member that also is dyslexic. Research, statistics, it is proven that if a child is dyslexic, there's a family member somewhere that is also dyslexic. So I guess they're in that research, they're connecting it to genetics. I can't say it is genetics. I'm just giving you the facts. Next, I wanted to talk about the health alert on sugar. Hold on because I'm guilty right now. I have something that I drew out. Hi, Isaiah. How you doing? I saw your face pop up, sweetie. I want to talk. There's a, a big health alert on sugar right now. And that's because of the drinks, foods that's being produced in the market. You have people that are either going to be hypoglycemic, hyperglycemic, or diabetes. Either way, all three of them are bad, okay? Everybody knows that sugar is going to come from sugar cane or sugar beets. I hope y'all know that, right? Everybody knows that carbohydrates is refined sugar. Carbohydrates, starches, I'm sorry, starches turn into sugar and refined carbohydrates is sugar. So you have the starches that converts into sugar. Sugar is also called glucose. And you have the refined carbohydrate and you have sugar from the sugar cane or the sugar beets. When it is released into the blood, meaning the red blood cells primarily because your white blood cells is for your immune system. When it is released into the blood, your body is going to tell you you want more sugar because your body has to remain within a normal range sugar level. If it is out of the normal range sugar level, if it's too low, hypoglycemic, and then there's a reaction for that. And if it's too much sugar, you're looking at diabetes or hyperglycemic. So let's talk about those. We're going to start with the hypoglycemic first. The body wants your, the body wants your sugar level to remain within a normal, normal range. So the body is going to release hormones. Hormones is part of your endocrine system. When that happens, it's going to decrease your blood sugar level. When your blood sugar level is decreased, you may be diagnosed as a hypoglycemic. Your body's going to do something so that your sugar levels can come up to a normal range. That's one side. Okay? This can lead to, and what happens is, with, with people that are diagnosed as hypoglycemic, this is what happens. They have that urge to eat. Their body tells them they're hungry. They just got to have it which leads to overeating. Overeating leads to obesity, cause and effect, y'all. That's how it works. 
That's how it works at the cellular level. That how that's how it works at the external level by what we put in our mouth to eat or to drink. Isaiah, we are we were talking about the pros and cons of homeschooling versus traditional schools. We talked about the IEP process for special needs children. We talked about IEP and dyslexia. We talked about uh, dyslexia for preschoolers. So the whole thing for tonight was all about homeschool, IEP, special needs children with an example of dyslexia. The other part to this is the health alert. The health alert is on sugar. That's what we're talking about. Hi, Angela. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's talk about the flip side of hypoglycemic. People who are diagnosed with diabetes is diagnosed, is diagnosed with diabetes because their sugar level is up which means that their body, your body, let me backtrack, your body naturally produces insulin from the pancreas, which is an organ. Is what it is. Pancreas is an organ, produces insulin. Insulin is a hormone. Once your body stops producing the amount of insulin that it's supposed to produce, you may be diagnosed as a diabetes. Diabetes type 1, diabetes type 2. So let's talk about diabetes and the things that cause it. Diabetes simply means your blood sugar is up, it is too high, you're eating too much sugar. And I'm gonna give you, okay. Okay, that would be you, all right. So I'm gonna give you an example. First, I'm having a flash. Wait a minute. I go through this, you see me? Y'all see me shining, say, Carol, you shining. That means I'm flashing. So let me tell you what happened to me. I used to go to Boston Market. I don't know if y'all have them where y'all at, but here we have a Boston Market. And Boston Market has sweet potatoes. Now, because I, I have hot flashes, I eat the sweet potatoes so the hot flashes can be reduced at bay to where I don't feel like I just want to take off all my clothes and get butt naked because I feel my pores opening up and my clothes is getting wet. So I eat the sweet potatoes to minimize the hot flashes. But I was going to Boston Market three times a week. I would get the sweet potatoes. And me and my little greedy behind, I wouldn't just get one small cup. I got two. I would eat one while I was there and then take one to go. Until I had an appointment with my PCP, primary care physician. And when I went there, it was time for my blood to be taken. He takes the blood and I had to wait like a week to get the results back. I get this phone call. My doctor normally don't call unless it's important. I get the phone call and he says, Carol, I don't know what you're doing, but you are borderline diabetic. I knew what I was doing, freaking Boston Market. And I said, okay. I know what it is. He said, what are you doing? Because you are borderline diabetic and you are more leaning towards more being diabetic. I said, okay. I stopped going to Boston Market. I don't go to Boston Market anymore. What I do to replace it is I go to the market, I buy the sweet potato, and I boil it. Once I boil it, I cut it open, put cinnamon on it, and that's, a, that's about as natural as I can get. Once I did that, I am no longer borderline diabetic. And I say all this to say this. We can control what we put in our temple. We can control what we put in our temple. We can control a lot of things that go on with our health based on what we are putting in our temple. And I'm going to give y'all some of those examples. 
So getting back to diabetes, the hormone insulin for people who's got, who, who, people who are diabetic has to take medication. Some take pills, some get injections. They get the insulin injections or they take the pill injections, diabetics do. As much as external insulin is a lifesaver, and it is, external insulin is a lifesaver. People who are on insulin have to make sure that they have eaten and have energy to, to make sure that when that medication, the insulin reaches a peak, there is energy that's there. If not, that person is going to go into something called a diabetic shock this i've seen what well bless his heart today because he crossed over i had a, i had a friend that was diabetic and he took the injections he had to make sure that within he would take the medication and he had to make sure he eat within the hour of taking that medication. So when the medication reached the peak, he had energy there to balance it off. He had, he had something there for that insulin to feed off of. Sometimes his life got too busy and they, he, took the, he took the medication, he gave the insulin, but it was no energy there, no food there to meet the peak to to meet the peak of the medication and he went into a diabetic shock and i've seen it and when diabetics go into a diabetic shock you need to make sure that you have orange juice and some type of sugar on hand to bring them back because here they're going. If they don't recognize you, they could seriously hurt you. And I mean seriously hurt you. You have to talk to them and talk about things that only you and them know while you got this orange juice and you shaking up the sugar cubes in the orange juice so they could come back. Hi, Damien, thanks for tuning in. So they could come back. Once they come back, make sure that they eat. Okay, Damon, call me because I reached out to you. Write my number down, 267-864-8639. 267-864-8639. So you want to make sure that you have, if you don't have the old-fashioned sugar cubes and you don't have no orange juice, Get that hard candy, the peppermint hard candy, and give them three of them right off the bat so that there's something there to feed it so they could come out of their diabetic shock. So that's how come I say, I'm sorry, y'all. That's how come I say as much as insulin is life-saving, and it is, it has side effects. It's not naturally produced because they have to take injections or they're taking a pill. So I'm gonna give you some of the side effects of insulin. One is kidney problems. Two is weight gain, there's a third one. Two is weight gain. Three is low blood sugar. Remember, diabetics are diabetics because they have too much sugar. The insulin brings the blood sugar level down but you don't want it to be so low. You want it to reach the normal range because your body wants to be in the normal range for blood sugar. If y'all have any questions, ask me, just type it in. So let's talk about, I'm gonna call off some things and then I want y'all to type in me if it pertains to you. So here we go. 
do you eat cookies? If you eat cookies, type me. If you eat candy, type me. If you eat pastries, type me. If you eat ice cream, type me. If you eat box cereal, type me. If you drink fruit juices, type me. If you drink soft drinks, type me. If you drink energy drinks like Red Bull, type me. If you put any type of sugars into your coffee, into your tea, such as a Spartame or other, other sweeteners, type me. Everything I just mentioned to you is refined sugars. Those are the things that you want to avoid. Now, I'm going to go because I'm also recording this. So I'm going to do something and then I'm going to tell y'all something about sugar. Um, let me share this and bring it back. Here it is. I'm going to share this. Share. I wish y'all could see this. Let me move this down. Let me move this over here. All right. I want to give y'all some diseases that are caused by sugar. And number one, sugar is an addiction because sometimes you may have a craving to have something sweet. Addiction, a sugar addiction. So diseases that are caused by sugar are ADHD, adrenal gland fatigue, allergies, asthma, cancer, cardiovascular disease, candida overgrowth, chronic fatigue syndrome. Hi, Ernest. Thanks for tuning in. Um, compromised wound healing, dental caries, depression. All these diseases is caused by sugar. Erectile dysfunction. I didn't know that. Okay. Um, fatty liver disease, gout, high blood pressure, high insulin levels, high triglyceride levels, high uric acid levels, which is urine, uric acid, increased stomach acidity, infertility, kidney disease, malnutrition, metabolic syndrome, obesity and rubber tire syndrome, osteoporosis, pancreatic stress, poor sleep, premature aging, Reduce immunity, frequent infections. Let's talk about reduced immunity, frequent infections. Let me go back to full screen. Hold on, everybody. Stop share. Now, here I am. Hi, everybody. I'm back. Reduced immunity. Everything I just mentioned is diseases that are caused by sugar. Remember in the beginning, when I first started out, I told you the two sources of sugar, the two natural sources of sugar in addition to the refined sugar, okay? Reduced immunity. Anytime I see the word reduced immunity, it has everything to do with, I'm gonna say three systems. your endocrine system, your cardiovascular system, and your immune system, reduced immunity. Your immune system is important. If there is no B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes, white blood cells is what I'm trying to say. Because white blood, your white blood cells matches with your immune system, point blank. To have a 
to have a strong immune system, you must have white blood cells. You must have white blood cells. And once again, we're talking about normal range. If you have white blood cells that are below the norm, hi Ed, thanks for tuning in. If you have white blood cells that are below the normal range, your doc, that's a, a red signal for your doctor. And your doctor may send you to a hematologist. How do I know? Mine's did it to me. And your blood is going to be tested to find out why your white blood cell count is low. It has to do with your immune system. Okay, so those are the things that I wanted to share. So what did we talk about tonight? We talked about the pros and cons of homeschooling versus traditional school. Do not, parents and grandparents, do not let someone tell you if you homeschool your child, your child's not going to have a social life. BS, your child's still going to have a social life. It's all about what you put into it when you homeschool your child. The second thing we talked about was the process of IEP, school psychologists, the testing. I told you about two tests. Anytime there is an IEP, make sure that you as the parent, the legal guardian, the grandparent, that your butt is there for that IEP. Anytime you get a letter in the mail or sent on by a child talking about we need to test your child, make sure you are sitting in that room while your child is being tested. I told y'all a story about a child that was tested without the parent being there and what the school psychologist came up with, which was false. So you want to make sure that you're in that room anytime your child is being tested. We talked about what happens after your child has been, I hate using this word because it's thrown around so much, after your child has been diagnosed with a disability, I told you about that process, which leads into the IEP, IEP process. After that, I, get, I used an example of dyslexia. I told you why I used dyslexia tonight for the core of what we are talking about because out of 20 students that are diagnosed with a disability, two to three of them has been diagnosed with dyslexia. We also talked about preschoolers that has been diagnosed with dyslexia. We also talked about who does the diagnosing with preschoolers and what happens. So parents, legal guardians, and grandparents, to sum all this up with the school thing, I'm all for homeschooling your child. Whether you are doing the homeschooling yourself or your child is enrolled in an online homeschool, and we talked about that as well. When it comes to IEP or any kind of testing or any kind of diagnosis, as a parent, be proactive into your child's education. Don't just let a school psychologist label your child or misdiagnose your child. I know that that has happened. I've seen that. Where a child was diagnosed with one disability and four years later, literally four years later, this child was tested for something else. This child had autism, misdiagnosed. You don't want that to happen with your child or your grandchild or the child that you are a legal guardian of. You want to make sure that you are engaged in every process, every step that there is when it comes to that little angel. So that's what I want to sum it up about the school, about the child, about preschoolers, about special needs, children, 
as far as the health alert on the sugar, I'm going to sum this up with be mindful of what you drink. Do like I do. I read freaking labels. When I go into the market and I'm buying anything because I'm a picky eater, I read the labels. If you don't know what those labels mean, read them, research them, look them up. If you see the word fructose, that means syrup. That got too much sugar in it. If you see the word sucrose, anything that has crose in it means sugar. Glucose, fructose, sucrose, all that is sugar. Refined carbohydrates, sugar. Starches turn into sugar, sugar. Natural sugars, sugar cane, sugar beets. If you have the urge for something sweet, try fruit. Pears, apples, oranges, kiwi, tangerines, grapefruit. All those are natural sugars. Grapes, seedless or non-seedless. All those are natural sugars compared to this list I gave y'all. Can y'all see this? Let me see. Can y'all see this? This is my, I'm not, I'm not an artist, but this is like my little artwork, my little notes that I have to keep up with so I don't go off track. So that's my time. I don't know what time it is. That's my time. And that's what I wanted to share. I will catch everybody on the next live stream my next live stream is my radio show i'm sorry my radio show every thursday i'm sorry every monday i'm on sadorradio.com and i am on the second part of gun violence gun violence is a four-part series we did the first part last monday well this monday we did the first part on gun violence and the first part was about personal experiences of individuals that have had someone that have died or committed suicide by a weapon. This Monday coming, um, the second part of gun violence is drugs and drug dealers. The third, third part, I'm going to try to do it. I don't know. My co-host said four parts, but I'm trying to do it in three parts. If it is four parts, according to my co-host, the third part is gun violence in schools. Um, the third part is gun violence in schools. And then the fourth part is gun violence um, police officers. So those are some guests that we'll, that we will be having inside the radio station. Now, some of the guests from what I understand, some don't mind being seen on the live and some don't want to be seen, but you can definitely hear their voices. And then we do have some people from different parts of the world that will come in on the Facebook live stream. So it's a the, the Let's Talk with Carolyn on SedoraRadio.com is totally different from the Women's Closet TV show. The only time that I will have the same topic on the radio show or the Women's Closet TV show is if I feel as though that topic is important enough for both audiences to hear or see. Because on the radio show, it's a different type audience because the radio is international and worldwide compared to Facebook Live or the Women's Closet TV. So tune in on Monday. Um, I got pushed back to, I used to be on 6 to 8, but I got pushed back to 8 o'clock because of my topics. And that's adult time because it gets real on my radio station with me and my co-host and guests that be on there. So I am on the radio, www.sadorradio.com. When you go to www.sadorradio.com, 
you're going to see two icons. You're going to see an icon for iPhone, an icon for Android. Whichever phone you have, click on that icon. And once you click on that icon, you're going to see um, live and direct marketplace, whichever it is. And you want to, you see other radio stations, you want to click on Sador Radio. Once you click on Sador Radio, you will hear me if you are there at Monday from 8 to 10 p.m. Other than that, you'll catch me live because I do go live from the radio station. I do go live on my Facebook from the radio station. So for my Facebook fam, you'll see me here, but I will be at the radio station. Every Thursday, I am here at the Women's Closet TV show and each topic will be different. So I like to take the time out to do this because I do this every time. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ernest. Thank you, Damian. Thank you, Isaiah. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Chani. Thank you, Chantel. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Camille. Thank you, Jackie. Jackie is an author. She has written a book. Jackie is out of Louisiana. And she is an advocate for special needs children. Thank you, Jackie, for tuning in and letting me know that I was on point. I appreciate that. And anybody else who was on here, thank you, everybody. Stay tuned to me on every Thursday at 7 o'clock. And sometime I start late because I be having technical difficulties. You can also, if you have not caught this, you can also catch it on the YouTube channel because I do have several YouTube channels and I'll probably post them later. Also, stay tuned every Monday at 8 p.m. because it'll be live, it'll be a Dell time. God bless everybody. Take care and stay tuned for the next show. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. As for you folks, I'd like to take the time out to say thank you for tuning in please share this video and subscribe to my youtube channel follow me on my facebook women's closet tv show as well as follow me and subscribe on the women's closet youtube channel take care everybody good night bye-bye